I thank you very much for uh, allowing me to come. I feel very, very honored. Um, and it's especially nice because my audience is so diverse, uh, and that is a wonderful, wonderful uh, thing for me to have. And um, <coughs> the, the reason for that won't become so immediately clear. Uh, I'm working in an area that's quite specialized, and I almost suffer from the problem that the colleagues that I work with here don't have as broad a background, and I'm really working on this area to restructure the whole discussion. And if we take this process, this way of thinking in a very different direction, I think they're really wonderful things that, that we can learn. Now, uh, Harry Markowitz got his PhD in the early 50s at the University of Chicago. And in 1989, uh, he won the Nobel Prize for the, some of the things that I'm going to show you that he, that he did. Um, he came up with the first um, return risk measurement that we have in finance, and it became very, very central. So when the, the first group of prizes, uh, people in finance, uh, uh, one, two were in, in portfolio theory and one was in corporate finance. And he is essentially the first person, uh, the earliest finance person that we have. Uh, he's still alive. Um, uh, friends tell me that when they called him, I, I don't know if you know this, but um, the Swedes call very early in the morning, if it's an American, something like six o'clock in the morning. And so he'd been waiting for the call for years and years, and he finally got the call that he'd won, and his response was, well, it's about time. Um, but his work was used for probably 30 years and incorporated in finance. It's still widely used today, very, very important work. One of the things that's not well known is that we, when we turn around and apply the model, it doesn't work very well. And why it doesn't work very well, we know, we, w has been out there in papers for years and years, 30 or 40 years. Um, and a lot of people have worked on the area, but really with very unsatisfactory results. And uh, so this has been, um, uh, a quest or uh, the goal of my work was to see if I could find the tools that could diagnose the problems and why it wouldn't work and whether we could in fact uh, set up a structure for a toolbox to get, the, to get the design to work well, at least tell us when it's going to work well and when it's not, looking forward. And so we can use basically classes of applications of his that have very good properties. So I'm going to be looking for the conditions where um, I, I can say, hey, this model is not going to work very well. And to try to describe those conditions, uh, I'm going to use a lot of different, I would say, teaching tools or explanatory tools. I'm going to make my discussion uh, almost non-finance oriented. And think about really a problem in statistics and how we can think of, of statistics. And it's going to be a little different than uh, some of the traditional ways that we do. Um, so what Markowitz is going to be doing is he's going to be solving for the asset weights. So let's say I have 10 assets in a universe uh, of stocks, and I want to find a portfolio that tells me how much weight I should have in asset one, how much I should have in asset two. And when we solve, when we use his math, we get a number, such as like 10% for asset A. And it's a specific stock or it's a mutual fund. It depends on how we set up the problem. And we typically do not think 
of that portfolio weight as having a probability distribution. And we take it as some kind of fixed number that's, that's predetermined and it doesn't have any random error in it. We can say we're taking the weight as if it's certain. And this is really a result of the way he set up the mathematics. So what if we're to envision that the weight is some type of random variable? So it could be in a specific range. Um, it could have its own probability distribution. What would the probability distribution look like? And what's going to come down is the distribution is going to be very strange, very bizarre. And it's in some conditions, it's going to, the whole system is going to blow up. So uh, we're going to have to think out a process for calculating the distribution of this weight. And uh, before I go off on my digression just a bit, I want you to think that um, there are many, many variables that we see um, that are basically random variables. And we want to think about them within a class of what the entire distribution should look like. So I'm on the board of this tiny little school. And the school hired a consultant to do a long range plan. And uh, let's say the per capita income is $75,000 in this nearby town. And what everybody started to do is it assumed that everyone in the town earned $75,000, which of course is not true. Some earned less and some earned more. And we want to know whether the income levels are going to be high enough to support a private day school. And so the tuition might be $16,000. And $75,000 is not going to support a $16,000 day school. But how much of the proportion of the population might be $120,000 or higher? And it's that kind of problem that where we have to look at distributions of things and we have to start thinking about drawing pictures. And this whole idea of moving from a point, which is really how we think of statistics, to a picture is very radical, it turns out. But that's actually where the fun begins, because if you can see a picture, you're going to see a lot more about what's going on. And many distributions, it's, it's going to turn out, are not going to be normal and they're not going to be easily, easy to describe. So the answer to my school problem is that we really don't know. And so we have to try a set of tuitions and see what works. The reported mean does not give us enough information. If we had the standard deviation with the mean, it still really wouldn't be enough. So the distribution is likely skewed to the right. In other words, it has a big, long tail out to the right. Um, a lot of people might earn 35000 and be on the left, but some people might be out on the right at 250000 120000 And we want a picture of that. We want to try to find out how we might get a picture of that. OK, the second example that I want um, to talk about, and some of my students know this example. Um, I was at a conference, um, the Financial Management Association. And um, every year, this last year, for example, it was in Tennessee. In this particular year um, that I, I went to, maybe six or seven years ago, it was in Salt Lake City. And just by random chance, I went into a session to discuss the CFA exam, Chartered Financial Analyst exam. And sat down, came in just a little late. I wasn't really planning to go. And they mentioned that they 
w had done a survey of CFAs and uh, lo and behold, the average salary was a whopping $485,000. And I thought, that is great. I can go back and do this with a pep talk for my students. <laughs> and of course, um, uh, you now know what to major in, right? But um, that's not really a fair story because there'll be people way off on the right that'll make 10 million and there'll be sort of normal people that'll make 100,000. So it's not really a totally fair story. So I, I'm a little, um, and the CFA Institute is, is very uncomfortable about me um, telling a lot of people about this number. They don't want, they know that they put the number out there, they, you know, but they're not giving you the whole story. Um, so I tell my students about these finance um, numbers. This student right here is past level one of the CFA exam. And so she's on her way, and I have one other student that's taking the exam. Um, but so the skewness here is more severe than my per capita income number. And the skewness is quite important. So now let's go back to the portfolio problem. And the problem is to find the optimal weights for the specific stocks. And you have to really give Markowitz a lot of credit because he developed the solution in a pre-computer world, really where you know, it was all worked out intuitively. And before I go back to finance, I'll just talk a moment about statistics. And uh, this is actually quite important to the central idea that, that I'll talk about. Um, when we take courses here, the courses I teach, uh, anybody else teaches, we teach us a style of statistics called, that we just call statistics, but more um, more honestly, it's a sort of classical model. And uh, this was um, developed by Fisher in England, and who, uh, the, who's the, the F behind the F test. And there's certain um, ways of approaching problems that have become quite standard. But there's a second branch um, that's become more popular. It was, it developed a little earlier, but Bayesians have always been in the minority, still are. We don't teach um, Bayesian statistics in our class. In some ways it's much more difficult, um, but it's, it's, not, it's not standard and our responsibility to students is to start with the standard curriculum. Now, Bayesian statistics use this concept of conditional probability. In some ways, it's really not what we think of statistics at all. They're just probability models where the results change based on the data that we see. And the interesting thing about Bayesians is that they see the world in terms of probability distributions that then can be graphed in terms of pictures. And that's what we're going to do today. And so Bayesians would see very quickly where we were going and the classical statisticians be more concerned with that point estimate. So it would, the, cla the classical statistician would say, um, uh, give me a number. And the Bayesian would say, give me a graph. Draw the distribution. Now, I was very, very lucky. I mean, I think a lot of what happens in life is hard work, but there's also this, this idea of luck. And when I was at Brown studying in economics for a PhD, I started there, I had a econometrics teacher, he's very famous, and he was a classical statistician, but becoming a Bayesian. And I didn't realize that, I didn't, he didn't explain this to any of us, but he was in the process of making this change. So 
he would explain every problem first from the point of view of a classical statistician and then from the point of view of, of a Bayesian. And from the point of view of a Bayesian, you have no problem at all of taking a weight on a portfolio solution and calling that a random variable and, and thinking, oh, how can I graph that? How can I create a picture of that? The Bayesian would naturally do that and would have great excitement, finish the problem in two or three hours. Um, a, a classical statistician could, could be stuck for 30 years on this. So the Bayesians are basically this idea that we have a belief that's in our prior distribution and they actually will formally say what the prior looks like. And then we see some data and we assume some kind of normal distribution and we see some kind of updating uh, typically. So as we update we have a new way to describe our beliefs and we have a probability distribution that captures these beliefs. Now, when I think of a probability distribution, I want you to think of like a little machine that you can look at and say, there it is, I can put things in and get things out. I mean, it's, it's not the way we would normally teach statistics, but that's the sort of the way that we're going to, to do what we're going to do here. We're going to form it by getting some data or making some assumptions. And we're, after we compute the probability distribution, we can take samples from the data. And the samples allow us to start running experiments. So this is our key idea. We can form some type of distribution you don't really need to know much about it right now. Um, it's going to be very easy to do with a computer. Um, the most I'm going to have to do to get everything set up is two or three lines of code. Enter my data, two or three lines of code, and ready to roll here. Um, but we can take draws from the distribution, very simple computer command, and create a new data set and gener generate a, a set of stock returns that we should expect to see for the future. Now, this might seem somewhat unusual, and it might seem somewhat like a digression. But about three weeks ago, I went to see a play at Yale Rep. And this was part of the play, but I'll give you a little bit of the background here. This is a play by Tom Stoppard, called Arcadia. There are lots of things that are going on in the play, but the, the sort of chassis, the, the way the, the structure of the play is organized, there is a, a, a set of characters that are in the 1800s, about 1809, and they're describing a world that's of Isaac Newton where everything is deterministic. And then they're going to move ahead nearly 200 years, not quite 200 years, and describe a world where everything is random. And I want to read you the line because here is someone talking about science and talking about random processes. And he's going to say certain things that, that are exactly what we're going to do here. And I was sort of sitting in the audience and I said, oh, yes, that's what I do. So here we go. If you knew the algorithm, read probability distribution, and fed it back 10,000 times, that's how many times I'm actually going to iterate the whole system. Each time there'd be a dot somewhere in the screen. So you run an experiment, you create a dot, the result. You'd never know where to expect the next dot second iteration, third iteration, so forth. But gradually, you'd start to see this shape. Right, that's the solution. It would be a mathematical object, but yes, the unpredictable and the predetermined unfold together to make everything the way it is. 
It's how nature creates itself on every scale. The snowflake and the snowstorm. Now, so what I'm going to do, this is going to surprise you a bit, is the distribution that I'm going to set up, which I can set up very quickly, three lines of computer code, I can try, take the sample data, make the Markowitz computations, solve for the weights, draw another sample to simulate some kind of investor experience out of sample, apply the weights from the first sample to the second, find a solution, do this 10,000 times. Draw a picture of the results and see where the problems are. So I'm simply going to follow the instructions from the play. Of course, I've been doing this for four years and I saw the play three weeks ago. But I was somewhat astonished that, you know, with this type of thinking. To describe that type of thinking, to most people in classical um, statistics, they'd say, why would you do this 10,000 times to draw a picture? So the picture will describe much more than any specific point. I get the results of 10,000 experiments. So specifically, say we have a data set and we can compute the mean and the covariance matrix. You don't need to know what these exactly mean. You might. But there are two statistical measures. We can make the computations each with one line of code so they're not threatening. And then we use the Markowitz solution, which is two lines of code. So this is very easy to do. We then draw a sec second sample, apply the weights from the first, find the solution. Second sample is a little bit like the investor looking at the future. You solve the weights from what you've seen in the past. You apply the weights to a new set of data, a new set of predictive returns from your probability distribution. And you have to do it many, many times. A single experiment is not interesting. 10,000 experiments are enough to describe really what will happen. If you ran the simulation 100,000 times, you won't get really any different results. So we're going to compute how well this model works. And sometimes we're going to find it works well, and sometimes we're going to find it works badly. And when it, we find that it works badly, we can sort of poke around the system and find out where, how it broke down. So think a little bit about you're um, going to take a picture of a system and you're going to go to the system and you're going to inject some dye into the system so when you take pictures you can see you know what's going on in the in the person's body as you take x-rays or whatever so the concept that we're finally going to measure is the sharp ratio which is this concept of the mean divided by the standard deviation, so it gives us some kind of risk-adjusted measure. So in each experiment, it's going to be a single sharp ratio. And in my finance class, when I talk about sharp ratios, I'll only compute one. For example, last night, we computed the regression line. I didn't go further to compute the sharp ratio, but I could have. And we have one solution. I wouldn't say to my students, oh, let's do this 10,000 times and make a picture. But that's all that I'm going to be doing in this paper. Um, so all the data is synthetic. In another sense, it's not real data that we actually observe. It's data from the probability distribution that describes the underlying structure that we think exists. And the idea of using synthetic data is you can run as many experiments as you want. We don't have to just work on this idea of drawing a picture of the sharp ratios, which is what I'll do 
and I'll show you what the graphs look like. But we have distributions of lots of things that we could find. There's really nothing that we can't get pictures on. So this paper is this <coughs> curious mystery of how Markowitz model and how it interfaces with data, whether it will work and not work, and each time we're going to run 10,000 trials. <coughs> and fortunately, it just takes a couple minutes to do. It's not a, a long, a laborious uh, set of experiments. So two results. First, we're not dealing with points anymore. We're dealing with distributions. This goes back to my you know, previous um, you know, allusions to problems with you know, trying to tell you what the distribution of CFAs are or demo of demographics are. Second, we can compute the distributions of all the different steps all along the way of the computations. So we can find out exactly where this thing is starting to break down, where the distribution starts to sort of blast off into outer space somewhere. So he, Markowitz wins the Nobel Prize in 1989, but his model doesn't work very well, and no one knows why. And lots of work has gone in to these very high-powered mathematical problems that just don't seem to do much either, called shrinkage estimators. That it doesn't really work is not really a secret. We all know this. We're very reluctant to tell our students, oh, by the way, this model doesn't work very well, <laughs> because we'll lose credibility, I think, with our students. But very honestly, we're not terribly proud of the fact that it doesn't work very well. And for me, when I thought out how to, I could tackle the problem, it became really an exciting problem to work with. So we're going to have a, a, a set of tools to sort of fix the Markowitz problem. We can't fix all circumstances, but we can find out when the model will work in well in the future and when we can expect that it won't. And that's about the best that we can do, but that's much better than knowing that. So we're going to go create a toolbox. I'm not going to get you into the details of the toolbox, but you can read the toolbox. There are basically four big tools. I'll show you some pictures. The, the most important is a picture. Um, and but I'm going to give you some hints of how all this works. We can get a distribution for each of the non-standardized portfolio numbers. Those are always going to be normally distributed. They're going to be easy to read, no problem. This distribution can tell us about the possibility that a weight would be positive or negative in any kind of random sample. So it's 50% being positive and 50% being negative, you know that there's a problem. If it's 70% positive and 30% negative, you still have it. You really want to see a situation where it's 95% or 5% of one sum of one. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is say something that's relatively complicated in the secret of the um, I have to tell you, I figured out how to crack this problem very quickly. I found that it was very difficult to describe to many people what I had done. So I could solve a whole class of problems in about, I don't know, two weeks of work or something like that leaving in a flash and a little bit of computer programming that's not very involved. Um, being able to say oh, I'm drawing pictures of shark ratios with most people would think I was a little bit in our space. Like, what do you mean by a picture? Shark ratio. Shark ratio is a point. It's a number. How do you take something that we treat as deterministic and you're calling a random variable? And the obvious answer is, 
It's always been a pain. It's never been a non-random. It's always been random. And because you assume it's deterministic, and all these parameters are very certain, we get ourselves an enormous amount of trouble. I'm making no greater assumptions than using the same tools that model it. I just draw samples from the underlying moments and run 10,000 experiments. So, it, this has taken a long time to figure out how to explain the problem. See, so, some of the findings from here was to reduce the math, not the human equations, uh, not torture the probability statements, not give you any theorems uh, and proofs. They're in the paper. How can I sort of knock those things out? Uh, my PhD advisor said, if it's not simple, then it's wrong. So there is a kind of underlying story that the the fundamental explanation has to be read recently. So the, the issue that I'm talking about is everybody was thinking about the sharp sort of solution as a point, not as a distribution. We need to see the distribution of all these things that we look at. Once you think about this for a moment, you get census data, and you say, oh, here's a census point. Oh, what's the distribution? And no one will perhaps know. The, the idea with uh, the big data uh, sets that we're collecting on people is that they will give very precise distribution characteristics. Okay, so I think the next The next thing we need to do, oh, I think I need some help on how to do this. I want to just look at some distributions. And because here I've been talking about this. And uh, so this is the first one I can do. Now, if you go that on a computer, the first thing you think is you obviously this. And then you redo it two or three times, and you find out that you did it. So what's the next thing you're going to ask yourself? What's going on in that left tail? Why did this thing do so bad? Now, for the first year, if I ever showed this in a conference, they would just be lost. Last winter, I went to Paris and presented a paper and the same kind of stuff. Of course, I had no idea what it was. We never got off the first year. You see, if, if you show someone that, you say, oh, it must be a mistake. So, is it a mistake or is it a tumor? Is it some kind of malignancy? Now, there's certain properties in this part that that will cause that left tail to grow or become strength. That if your data set has certain kinds of properties, it's going to start to malfunction. And you start tracking those. So a little bit about what this is. Um, so this is a normal curve. These are 10,000 experiments, 10,000 experiments results. And this is the Sharpe ratio. There are um, basically two assets in the portfolio. There's a large star stock market portfolio, and there's a small stock portfolio. And the computer is asked to figure out what the optimal holding of both assets would be. So the problem is very simple. And um, because we have only two stocks, that it's easy to, to draw all the different distributions and figure out what's going on. 
of what's happening is it can't figure out how much of a small stock portfolio. When I show you some more graphs, it just gets totally lost in figuring out at all what's going on in the small stock world. And sometimes it really starts to get confused and set up positions that are completely untenable and have bad results in the future. So we start thinking about constraints we could put in the system or even more fundamentally, draw some pictures to see that we will have these kinds of bad results. So, So these, this, this portfolio has two assets, and I don't think I, I should have gotten bigger pictures here. Um, this is zero to the probability of the market. So it does a very good job of holding a positive weight in the market. But here is zero to the probability of holding the small stock portfolio. In other words, half the time it's saying it's negative, and the other half the time it's saying it's positive. When it's negative, you hold more of the market portfolio. If it's positive, you hold less. And so this says that this is a reliable asset to hold. This says this is totally unreliable. And now you can see where we're going to go. We're going to develop a toolbox sort of poke around the system, figure out what works and what So here's another distribution of securities. In the Markowitz solution, what we do is we add the two weights together to standardize them. And there's certain things that seem very mechanical. But it turns out <coughs> that the standardizing scalar need not always be positive, and when it becomes negative, it will reverse the signs of all the weights, and you'll just have confusion and chaos. So I then start monkeying around, and I say, well, if I have these kinds of problems, can I do better? Can I put a constraint in the system to get a better picture? And yes, when the portfolio starts to malfunction, I, I, I stop the computations and I have it revert to another solution. So I can get some improvements. So there are four different tools, and I can go through and describe some of the technical details, but I think that's probably as far as I want to go today. The most important thing wasn't so much what the mathematical equations are, but rather to think of statistics as, oh, these are a bunch of random experiments. Let me draw, let me make 10,000 experiments. Oh, I can do this right now on my computer. So, to repeat again, sort of what from the play, if you knew the algorithm, the probability distribution, the Markowitz design, and feed it back 10,000 times, each time there'd be a dot somewhere on the screen, which is really what we see in the history. You never know where you expect the next dot with each iteration, so to speak, but gradually you start to see the shape. So there it is. That is the solution to the Markowitz problem where the behavior is substantially better. And it does work because you're seeing much improved uh, performance here. So with that, can I answer any questions that you might Yes. What made you decide that you wanted to 
diving this problem is how to do well that that's a fun question that's a fun question this is often how research starts i have a very good friend who used to teach me hanko do you remember sean Lee? Mm -hmm. okay he's now the associate dean of quinn huh? and he's um he created a, a project for students where they would go and find the Markowitz solutions uh, in Excel using Solver. And he would set up this little problem and he'd tell them, that, you know, this solution that you're going to get from Markowitz is going to be better um, than the solution of equally weighting assets. And I thought about it and I thought, gosh, that's that's kind of interesting. I wonder about any kind of previous work here. And then I looked and then I saw these papers that said, no, it doesn't do that. And then when you find that it doesn't really work that way, it sets up a question. And I was lucky because I had this this uh, teacher in econometrics, which is sort of the fancy version. Um, that um, had written a book about Bayesian econometrics, and, um, and Bayesians are always thinking in terms of these probability distributions from which they draw data. Um, but it's a very difficult way of thinking. I have a friend who's a Bayesian econometrician, and I said, "How you know, years and years ago, I said to him, how's life as a Bayesian? And his response was very lonely. <laughs> because you're doing things that most people would not understand. It's just we really would not be thinking about the same one. Um, Richard Highfield, who's here in the faculty, um, uh, is a Bayesian econometrician too. And um, uh, his dissertation advisor at uh, the University of Chicago was probably the most famous of all Daisy and Conditions are not the same. So there is this influence out there. There's a way of thinking about things. Um, and I was very lucky to have exposure from some people that forced me to think a little differently. I must say, changing over was a little bit like requiring a brain transfer. Because I, they would keep talking about pictures and I was a, I just computed the regression of beta is 1.2 the magnitude of that. What? And um, the interesting thing is it's only when the graph becomes abnormal and you find things going wrong that you could use it to diagnose the system. And that's where I was lucky to find with the graphs that things could go very, very bad. Yes. Um, is there any way you'd like to advance this research further? Is this I actually have about five papers, and they're all sort of progressing, and I have to get them all into a near finish um, situation before I can start launching them into journals, because um, I have to know where one paper starts and stops, um, and make sure my system is coherent across all the different topics or that I'm working with. So the second paper comes up, I mean, once the paper is up to 70 pages, you have to start reducing it. So the second paper uses a bunch, uses a similar story, um, comes up with some new graphic features. The third paper studies the distribution uh, in a more of a classical way. Once we get these distribution that look strange, what do we do? You know, how do we run tests on them. Um, the fourth paper looks at robust tools um, and um, where robust regression are specialized regression tools. They do the same thing, but they have different types of constraints. In them. The fifth paper is, is actually a little too bad right now for me to tell you what it's about. Yeah? How does this solution 
help you figure out how many people can afford that $16,000 day school in a small town. Okay, let's go back to that. To answer that question, you would have to get much more information on the demography of the towns. And you'd have to see how many people have incomes of maybe 120,000. And whether they're in childbearing years. And honestly, I don't think the census data will get that detailed in terms of reports that you could access. So what would actually happen in a circumstance which is typically going to happen is that a consultant is going to come in and give a report and he's going to say some things that should be not taken as sort of gospel. Because it's not the, not the case that everybody makes $76,000. The question then, from a marketing point of view, is how do you find the population that you want? And for that, you, you need more data or you need tricks to go and set the rates at a certain level and see who shows up. You know, you have, you have lots of tools at your disposal. Where we're moving in terms of data analysis to have larger and larger data sets that will give us more about the distribution. The um, companies like Procter & Gamble, you know when you go to the grocery store, that all that scanner information is being collected and they're figuring out all your buying <coughs> um, They're going to use your zip code to figure out what your likely income is. What your, I mean, this is a very data-rich environment. Um, we've had all this information for years and years to be captured. We're now just getting to um, a time period where we have computers that are big enough and fast enough to crunch it. So the graphic artist um, that are here, part of life is creating a wonderful picture because that's what explains things. And my problem was that my picture was a little troubling because um, it didn't conform to what people expected to see. Yes. How do you know when to apply the constraints to the distribution? You just try and see what happens. You just, to a certain extent, you're just a wild pirate out in the Hey, what did you do this? What would it look like? You run the experiment 10,000 times and you find out. Maybe it might make things worse. You know. Yeah. So you said we're comparing uh, classical statistics to Bayesian statistics. Yes. That the uh, classical uh, statistician would take them take years to solve a problem, or uh, they wouldn't think this way. They wouldn't think about taking draws from a probability distribution. They might if they're very very advanced, but not likely. So they would never really be faced with the same problem. They would, they would be faking. We're well, all faced with the same problems. They would never think of how the solution of how to go about creating a probability model and taking draws from the model. That type of story is fundamentally a Bayesian story. And people think of Bayesians as having, you know, priors and get more information and I update them and I have better and that cost It's sort of like trying to figure out how the Yankees and the Red Sox will do next to it. They start in a certain way where they assign certain free agents. Um, we can maybe predict their, their future season. That's the way most people think of Bayesian. That's not really their important concept. What they, their important concept is actually to work fundamentally with conditional probability models that now have a structure, almost like a little machine that sits in the desk that you can draw samples of and not experiment. That is their, their blazing contribution. And then over time, they will become increasingly more important. They in sense for the future.
papers getting up. I think we're done. Anybody have any other questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Boyd. Oh, sure.